Good evening, everybody. Welcome to class number seven of the Book of Lost Tales, and happy Gondorian New Year to you all. Uh, it is Gondorian New Year uh, 2015. I'm not quite sure what uh, that is uh, in uh, fourth age terms, if, we're, if we are still in the fourth age, that is. Um, but uh, anyway, glad to have you joining me here today. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is actually a really fun class for uh, what Tolkien Society has called Tolkien Reading Day. Um, and uh, because it, it's one, you know, we're going to be, of course, talking about the Book of Lost Tales. But this is, I think, a, you know, what I want to talk about in the story today really has sort of implications, um, you know, sort of further beyond and, and I, uh, beyond that is just beyond the Book of Lost Tales itself. Um, and I think really does a lot to help us kind of understand a little bit more of the big picture of sort of what Tolkien is thinking about and working on, um, especially during these, you know, this, uh, this early half of his career. Um, so it'll be, that, that'll be fun. Um, a couple announcements as usual, uh, before we begin here, first of all, for those of you who, uh, missed it, uh, Mike Drought gave his, gave the, uh, the first of our, uh, new lecture series, uh, on Monday. Uh, it was an ex. it was a, it was, it was sold out. Well, we weren't selling tickets. It was free, but we maxed out, uh, our capacity. Uh, so that was really great. Um, the, for those of you who missed it, don't worry, we will have a recording. Uh, we do have a recording, uh, which will be released in video and audio form. Um, so that will be, uh, that will be coming out shortly. Um, and, uh, it should be great. It's the, uh, drought stuff is really, really incredible. Uh, and, uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was certainly a lot of fun. So again, if you missed it, don't worry. Um, we, um, you know, we will, uh, make sure you have a chance to, to, uh, to watch it. Um, and stay tuned, uh, stay tuned for the announcement of the, uh, of the next lecture as well. We have, uh, we have an excellent series. Again, if you go to that, uh, the webpage that I linked for you last time, if you go to the, the Mythgard Academy page and look at the lecture series, uh, website, you can see that the speakers that we have coming up, um, should be some, some really great, some really fun stuff, uh, that I'm really looking forward to. So, um, so definitely stay tuned for that and we'll keep you posted. Um, one other much smaller, uh, event, but which I wanted to invite you to, I'm giving a talk on the theme of Gondorian New Year, uh, next week on Monday. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I was invited, uh, to give this, uh, talk at a very special place, uh, which is the Bird and Baby Pub in Mickle Delving. Um, that is, I'm going to be giving this game, uh, I'm going to be giving this lecture in-game in Lotro, uh, the, the Lord of the Rings Online on the Landreval server at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time on uh, Monday night, next Monday night, uh, at the Bird and Baby Pub in Mickle Delving, as I said. Uh, and uh, the theme of the talk is going to be, you know, we're, it's, it's on the Gondorian New Year, so uh, the title of my talk is... Frodo and Sauron at the Cracks of Doom. What were they thinking? We're going to be looking at sort of Frodo's point of view on the Cracks of Doom. What's going on in Frodo's head in the Cracks of Doom? What's going on at Sauron's head in the Cracks of Doom? How do we understand that that climactic moment uh, of the Lord of the Rings? Um, so again, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm going to be giving the lecture uh, live in game. We'll have recordings of that available uh, afterwards. So uh, so that should be that should be fun. But I want to make sure to invite you all. Uh, if you are interested in coming. Um, and uh, don't forget two upcoming things. The one that I've been announcing, which is um, uh, which is our summer courses, which are now open for registration, our H.P. Lovecraft course and my course on Tolkien's poetry. Um, those, are, uh, those are both shaping up to be really exciting classes. So I hope you can join us uh, for one or both of those. And don't forget that uh, as we work into now the second half of our Book of Lost Tales 2 class. We still have a good deal of ground to cover, but, uh, but we're definitely uh, in, moving into the final phase of, that, of, that, of this class. And uh, remember, what is coming up next is The Princess Bride. So we're probably going to take maybe one week off, and then we're going we're gonna to launch into The Princess Bride uh, after that. So that should be a lot of fun, I think, and I'm really looking forward to that, too. I've never taught that book at all, uh, so uh, this is going uh, to be sort of fun new ground for me. So, uh, uh, so, I'm, so I'm pretty excited. Okay, those are our announcements for today. So let's talk about... Um, let's talk about... The Nauglifring, the story of the Nauglifring. Now, as you can tell from Christopher Tolkien's commentary, 
the this whole story, the story of the necklace of the dwarves and its combination with the Silmaril, this story which encompasses the downfall of what was Artenor and will later become Doriath, and the death of he who was Tinwillant and will become Thingol, um, is one of the mo- you know he 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 calls it Christopher Tolkien calls it this textual jigsaw puzzle. Um, it's clearly a a sort of a f- sort of a frustrating thing for Christopher Tolkien himself. Um, he talks about it on more than one, you know, he writes about it on more than one occasion. Um, uh, and was clearly a, a place in the larger narrative, um, you know, the larger story of the first stage, where Tolkien kind of stumbled a lot more than he did in other places. I mean, even though in the stories we've been looking at, the fall of Gondolin, the story of Turambar, and the story of Baron and, and Tenuvio, you know, we, we, we've talked about the, the, you know, the wide difference between the Book of Lost Tales versions of these stories and what we see later on, and there's, you know, we, we, we've explored some of the ways in which we can see how the story is going to go, um, and ways in which the story is shifting. With the story of the Nauglifring, it's much more complicated than that, right? I mean, it's, it, you'll notice Christopher Tolkien doesn't even bother doing his, like, blow-by-blow blow, compare and contrast with the published Silmarillion, right, as he usually does with these other stories. He didn't even bother with that this time, because there's so much that's different. It, it just sort of the whole thing kind of holds together less, or, or maybe another way to say it is that there, there, there are more kind of big conceptual problems or challenges, I guess, uh, in this story for Tolkien than we see in some of the other stuff. And what I mean by that is, even though, even though major elements of the stories are going to change, such as you know the whole Baron be- becoming a human and that becoming the absolute center of that story. Um, that's a major change, as we discussed when we uh, when we began. Um, but it's but nevertheless, despite the fact that it's going to change in this enormously momentous way, nevertheless, the story as it exists in the Book of Lost Tales at least works, right? I mean, it 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 holds together clearly, and you don't read you know you can read it and say, "Wow, that's real different," but you don't read it and say. I'm not sure about that. It doesn't really hold together all that well. The story of the Nauglifring is, I think, difficult in that way. Um, you see even Christopher Tolkien being more um, sort of openly critical of it, of many of its elements. Um, you know, and that it, and it, where it seems um, from the changes that Tolkien, the, from the kind of changes that Tolkien made later on, um, that he himself really moved away from some of these things, but never really fully cleaned it up. Christ, uh, Christopher Tolkien has admitted that, that that part of the published Silmarillion was one of the messiest parts. Don't forget that the published Silmarillion was not just, it was not just a question of Tolkien, um, you know, having his papers, which he hadn't gotten through the publication process, and Christopher Tolkien getting it published after his father's death. There was a lot of editorial work still to do. Um, and uh, both with some of the longer versions of these stories, which had ne- which had not been compressed into the final, more compressed uh, or epitomized, to use Christopher Tolkien to use Christopher Tolkien's more fancy word, um, into the epitomized form that he uses in the Silmarillion. Um, so there's some that hadn't been translated in that way, but in many cases, what hadn't been finished yet was the retconning, making it all fit together. Um, because he kept changing his ideas about things, and then the, many of the new ideas that he had, um, you know, he needed to go back and change other stories to make sure that they all fit in together. And um, his work on it was so sort of scattered around that uh, that it, there was a lot of work still to do to kind of iron it out. Um, this bit, the story of the Nauglifring, or the Nauglamir, as it will later come to be called, um, and the fall of Doriath... Um, was one of the thorniest bits, and the, and one of the places where the gaps were biggest. Where again, Christopher Tolkien has admitted that, you know, confronted with needing to sort of tidy that up and fit it into the published Silmarillion, there was some of the most work to do in that section to fill gaps and try to extrapolate what his dad was trying to do, um, than in than in than almost any of the other uh, parts of the narrative. So, um, so this this chapter is a for that reason kind of a. a or not for that reason, but as part of that story, we can see already that this chapter is a sort of a problematic thing, and it's it's kind of tempting, in some ways, to uh, uh, to to kind of dismiss or downplay this 
this story a lot. You know, I get to sort of... Well, we are spending less time on it than we spent on the others, but that's just because it's shorter. Um, but that is, you know, just to kind, of, to kind of push it aside. I don't want to accuse Christopher of pushing it aside in his commentary, but you'll notice how much less commentary there is on this one than, than on uh, the other stories. Um, and, uh, again, he doesn't even do the comparison. He just kind of lets a lot of it rest. Um, but you can see there are problems. Let me give some examples. I've been talking about how problematic it is, and I don't want to just leave that vague. Um, I mean, I'd be interested to see some of the things that you found, um, you know, if there were things that you found puzzling or, or sort of confusing or that didn't really seem to work together in this story. A couple things that I would point to. Tinwellen's desire for treasure seems a little odd. I mean, just that his sort of fixation on I want wealth which doesn't seem to f suit the way that Tolkien has depicted elves, at least not, you know, his kind of elf. Um, that is to say, he's not one of the Noldoli who are, you know, smiths and craftsmen, and there's always been that element with the Noldoli of their attachment to the, their works of hand. So their relationship with treasure is different, is intense at times, you know, like uh, with, of course, Feanor and the Silmarils being the most extreme example um, of that kind of intense uh, and perhaps unhealthy relationship. Um, but, but anyway, this idea of this basically rustic elf lord saying, I really want more bling around my palace. I don't have enough bling, um, and I pine for bling. Um, and I'm going to ignore my divine wife who says, no, 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 that's cursed bling and will lead to your destruction, but I don't care because I want bling. Uh, now, the idea that this elven king is going to be disregarding the advice of his divine wife is going to be consistently borne out throughout the history of his development. Um, but Thingol's reasons for ignoring Melian at least seem a little bit better later on, um, rather than just this like, ooh, shiny, that Tin Wellant seems to kind of get here, and it's I find it hard to be really uh, uh, really satisfying. Nick kind of likes the fact that he still ignores Melian, right? Yeah, it's it's uh, uh, or Gwendoling, or Gwendolyn or, or Wendeling, or whatever her name is. Her name is really hard to track. Um, I'm going to call her Gwendolyn in this class, because that's what she's called for the majority of this chapter. <laughs> so, but you know who I'm talking about. Um, uh, she who will later be called Melian. Um, anyway, so, uh, 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 back to, oh yeah, so ignoring, ignor ignoring Gwendolyn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, let's see, uh, good, uh, Kate, uh, Neville was saying, greed is an odd characteristic of an elf who has won the love of a Maya fae. You know, Kate, you're absolutely right. I hadn't been thinking in exactly those terms, but I think you've struck on one of the other reasons why that seems to me so unsatisfactory. Um, because you'd think somebody who had the non- you know, monetary blessings that Tin Wellant had in his wife and his daughter um, would have been, I don't know, just the idea that he would be like, yeah, 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 but the bling, right? But the shiny! I, I, it's, 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 it does seem less satisfying. Um, um, yeah, Yana points out that the whole movement of the character uh, the whole movement of, of the character that becomes Melian uh, is confusing, and, and she seems played down in power and knowledge. Yeah, we're going to look at that a little bit later, Yana, but I agree. It's kind of a little... It, it's a little bit hard to place her. There are times in the early... Like in the story of, of, of Tenuvia, when she seemed very wise and very lofty, and she is less so here, and it's it's not it's not really quite clear. Um, uh... Yeah, Yana suggests, could the winning of Gwendolyn here be, you know, a sign of, of, of greed, in a way, at least? Well, Yana, you know, it's another way to think about it, that there seems to be a way in which the kind of lust for wealth and status, really? I guess? I mean, that's what it seems to be, right? Because I keep using the word bling, which is I'm, I'm using semi-humorously, but there's a sense, I think, in which that word fits quite exactly what Thingol is looking for, right? He's not looking for wealth. And wealth implies you're going to, you want, you know, financial resources 
and you have a plan to do something with those financial resources. He doesn't want wealth. He wants bling. He wants a fancy, shiny sword and uh, and a and a fancy, shiny crown. And he wants to be decked out splendidly in ways that he's never been decked out splendidly before. Um, and that's the the shallowness of that fixation by Tin Welland um, does seem to me to 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 sort of undermine him and you know Yana does it in some sense uh you know could it potentially undermine our our sense of his desire for you know uh, like basically i mean this whole that you know Yana it raises the horrible idea of Tinwellin viewing Gwendolyn as a trophy wife right I, I I want the bling, you know, to match my girl, because I've got a goddess over here, right? And I got the bling, and now, like, I, you know, I'm the... I, I mean, that's a horrible way of thinking of Tin Welland, and very little else in his depiction has justified anything of the sort. Um, but again, I think that, to me, that's why that unevenness jars, I find, in this story. Um, and... Uh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah Yana, is also, Yana is also thinking of his protectiveness of Tenuvio uh, and, uh, you know, wondering if, if, you know, again, that could be, you know, again, it, the, the, the potential for viewing that in a more sort of, you know, simply possessive or kind of proprietary way in that, in that sense as well. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> his fancy shiny daughter, exactly, Yana. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good. Karita was making the same point about his possessiveness uh, of his of his daughter. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I uh, um, we'll we'll look at some more passages about this. But but I think you guys are doing a great job of pointing pointing you know sort of explaining this issue a little bit more. One of the things that again I think just this story as we get it, the story of the Nauglifring as we get it here, just seems less satisfying than the other stories. Another example of another thing that I would be is on my short list of stuff that d- doesn't really work great in this story is the invasion of Artenor. Right? That is okay. So Gwendolyn has this protection around now it's not like the later girdle of Melian, right? I mean that thing is inviolable. Um only one driven by fate, you know, Baron gets this like special divine exception uh to the girdle, but nothing else can come in oh okay, Carcarus. Carcarus and Baron are the only two things, um and they have like total special exception clauses, right? Um and you see of course the published Silmarillion gets around the whole girdle of Melian issue in a completely different way. Um, here we have the mere fact that an elf escorts the uh, the dwarves into Artenor is enough to get past Melian's protections. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, it's, I mean, again, this is something that Christopher Tolkien himself flags as being a little weak. Um, you know, that they just really, they just needed an Noldor guide and then Melian's protections were helpless against this enemy army coming in to sack the place. Uh, it just kind of seems like a pretty darn huge loophole uh, in, uh, in in Gwendolyn's protection of Artenor. Um, and again, she's going to, she as so many of these characters will, she's going to grow over time. All of these characters get bigger and, you know, more effective and more sort of epic over time. But, um... Uh, but still, even as it stands, th- it seems it seems kind of weak. Um, two issues that we're going to spend quite a bit of time tonight talking about, um, uh, and the way it, the the roles that they play in these stories are the whole curse laid upon the treasure, or the issue of the curse laid upon the treasure, and how that works, and the extent to which that works, um, and the way that the fate of Baron and Tenuvio are, is connected into this. We're going to look at both of those things, because um, those, I think, are, are certainly very central and important issues uh, in this story, uh, and obviously connect to things that we've been talking about before, too. So anyway, so all of this stuff is sort of some of the least resolved, even later on, you know, even at the very end, even after Tolkien's death, a lot of these things still weren't fully resolved and fully integrated and brought to sort of the same level of continuity and consistency with the rest of the stories as Tolkien had devised them. Um, 
But the thing I would say about this, um, of course, Tolkien does move away from a lot of these a lot of these things, right? The idea of the curse on the gold is going to fade. It's not going to vanish, but it's going to fade, right? Um, this is not going to become centrally a story of cursed gold anymore. Um, later on uh, in his career, the the dwarves themselves are going to change. Um, uh, you know, think and 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 think about the the significance of the shift from Ufethin, the that is the the traitor uh, 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 Noldo who who leads the dwarves in. Think of the shift from Ufethin to Aeol, who clearly inherits a lot of Ufethin's characteristics. Right, that like weird loner elf who hangs out a lot with dwarves and may or may not be a traitor to his kin. Right. Um, that's uh, uh, certainly is a shifty character, right? Um, Aeol seems to take over that role um, that was originally designed for Ufethin, but of course the the role that Aeol, of course Aeol gets kind of grafted into the Gondolin story, as Christopher Tolkien explained a little bit at the very end of his commentary on the fall of Gondolin. But um, uh, but again, you think of the role that uh, you know the way in which that that concept of the dark elf who is the friend of dwarves and uh, of sketchy personal integrity, the way that that gets put off on the fringes, literally on the fringes of Doriath, right, in this in the later Silmarillion, but completely fringe and indeed totally unrelated to the actual destruction of Doriath in the later story. Um, that's, uh, um, uh, that's, Again, I think an interesting sort of piece of evidence of the way that we can see Tolkien shifting from some from what are really the fundamental core ideas of this story. And again, you think about that; that doesn't happen in any of the other stories, right? Um, there are radical differences between the fall of Gondol and the story of Turambar and the story of Baron and Tenuvio f- between those and the later versions. But there are, I mean, we don't see Tolkien just completely moving away from the basic concepts of those stories. Um, he, he alters things, even things really close to the core, as in with Baron becoming human. Um, but that's, in a sense, an addition to the story, not a, a, I'm going to take it and I'm going to push it in a, in a completely different direction. I'm going to do... I'm gonna I'm gonna remove that story and do something fundamentally different. The story of the Nuglifring is fundamentally a story of the curse on the dragon's treasure and the tragedy which the dra- which that curse brings uh, to Artenor. Um And the primary vehicle for that is treachery, the treachery of Anoldo. All of that stuff basically goes away in the later version of the story. And again, I, I can't think of any of the other of the Lost Tales where you could really say that. Where if you know where, where the core synopsis of what happens in this story leaves um, and becomes something completely different. But, having said that, as I say, it's still worth looking really carefully at this story because don't forget Tolkien's retentive tendencies. And I talked about this before. Tolkien was a great recycler or reuser, he th- he he threw almost nothing away, uh, uh, literarily speaking, and you know we see it even in things that he does completely abandon. Uh, let me give an example of what I'm saying. Um, you remember that moment in the published Silmarillion when it were near the end and we're approaching the fall of Gondolin, and uh, uh, the narrator is t- is talking about. Melkor's sort of increasingly frantic search for Gondolin, his, try, his attempt to discover where Turgon is uh, and to find Gondolin and destroy it. Um, and the narrator explains why Melkor is so fixated on Gondolin. And the reason is, you remember this? The reason is that there's something about Turgon that even when they had been in Valinor together, whenever Turgon had gone by, Melkor had felt this premonition of doom. You know, that like it. So Turgon always gave, you know, Morgoth the heebie jeebies back in Valinor because he had some kind of premonition that his doom would come from Turgon. Do, do you remember that passage that I'm talking about in the Silmarillion where the narrator tells us this? Well, it's one of those passages which all by itself is really quite puzzling. Um, it's. There are. 
uh, that is to say, I always found that a little bit dissatisfying. No, a lot dissatisfying. Because, I mean, it's a, it's a cool line. It's like, ooh, yeah, the idea, like, you know, Melkor's premonition of doom and, like, Turgon is super important. But then you actually read The Fall of Gondolin and you're like, um, so, uh, how exactly does that prophecy come to pass? I mean, okay, yes. His doom came through Turgon in the sense that Eärendil comes through Turgon, and Eärendil is the one who precipitates the War of Wrath, which leads to his downfall. But that's pretty indirect, and you can say the same thing. You know, Eärendil had several other grandparents, right? And it's not really true of them. I mean, did Melkor have the same bad feeling about Galdor, for instance? I mean... You know, I mean, the dude had, four, you know, Arendel had four grandparents for crying out loud. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty. It's kind of a, a wishy-washy prophecy, at least in its in, in the indirectness of its full fulfillment. It seems like a kind of a wishy-washy prophecy. Well, but when you go back, you go back to the Lost Tales and to his later revisions of stuff. You know, you go back to like the nineteen thirty. Uh, uh, Quenta stuff when he first starts putting together this sort of synopsis mode uh, of the uh, the Silmarillion material uh, when he returns to it later on. Um, you remember what was Olmo's message to Turgon? Right, the whole point, what the whole reason Tuor was sent. What does he tell Turgon to do? Fight exactly. Nick, he tells go out and whoop. Melko, right? Take your army, go meet him in the plain because you can overthrow Melko and the Valar will fight with you, right? And that is, in fact, Tolkien doesn't abandon that idea right away. Uh, and indeed, in some of the revisions, Turgon does go and march against Melkor. And then, and that's where the, you know, so so it's like we have, uh, you know, he rethinks that element from the Book of Lost Tales, and and we do have uh, uh, we do have Turgon going on the on, on the on the aggression, or at least like the chance of it. That makes sense, right? It makes it that Turgon is fated to overthrow Morgoth. He's got a really big role. He's really he's a really important dude, and so the prophecy isn't about his grandson; it's about him. Um, my point in talking about this is merely to say, notice, Tolkien leaves that bit in the scene <laughs> later on. There's a reason Christopher included it in the published Silmarillion, because Tolkien had retained it. It was still there in his later reworkings of the Silmarillion materials. Even though the events that that prophecy alludes to don't happen anymore in, in Tolkien's rev later revisions of the story. So he keeps the prophecy even when the thing it's prophesying no longer is even on the table in the story. Again, because it still kind of works, it's still kind of cool. And you'll notice how in the published Silmarillion, it picks up on the really cool final words of Huor, right? You know, Eärendil's other grandfather, right? Um, when, uh, you know, from you and from me, a new star shall arise, right? So you got that, that, that uh, you know, who are seeing with the eyes of death and prophesying the rising of Eärendil. And so it kind of, you know, it kind of plays out. You know, you got the, 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 you know, the, the two granddaddy prophecies, and that's kind of fun. Um, but, um, I, but anyway, I mean, you know, so I'm not saying it doesn't work and it's a horrible line in the published Silmarillion. What I am saying is that it's an example of Tolkien's retentiveness, how he tends to keep stuff in uh, and and not to just ditch things and throw them away. Um, so what am I talking about? What am I referring to in the Book of Lost Tales version of the Nauglif Ring? Well, I, there's a lot of stuff in here that I think is important to remember, and in fact some things which I think are some really important revelations. Um, and it is my argument that this chapter, this story from the Book of Lost Tales, <clears throat> helps to cast more light on some of Tolkien's other writings with which you are familiar than, than anywhere else in Tolkien's writings. I am referring primarily to The Hobbit. Um, let's, uh, let's look at some examples. So, um, Bilbo gets to the Caves of the Wood Elves, in chapter nine, in, in in chapter nine, or the end of chapter eight, in, in chapter nine of the Hobbit, um, and 
you know, the Elven King in The Hobbit kind of sounds a lot like Thingol, right? I mean, everybody is... Uh, not everybody, but I mean, many people have observed that, right? You know, you've got this, you know, this elf... Uh, kingdom in the middle of the forest and underground next to the river and and then you know you do a little bit of digging and discover that the uh, you know the 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 actual p- the picture that Tolkien included of the gate of the Elven King's halls and the illustration that he did for the uh, for the for the for the Hobbit edition uh, is actually recycled from his uh, depiction not his depiction of Menegroth his depiction of Nargothrond actually um, but uh, but again you know this sort of elf stronghold next to a river we can see him recycling stuff even there um, yes the Elven King sounds a lot like Thingol. But he sounds even more like Tin Wellant. Remember Tin Wellant? Why did he need bling? Or like, what is one of the pieces of evidence that, that were given uh, that he that he needs bling? Karita, you had mentioned it earlier on. Do you remember one of the things that we were told to sort of, to illustrate the, the the sad, sad poverty of poor King Tin Wellant? His leafy crown. Exactly. He just he, unlike most other elf sovereigns, he only had a crown of of autumn leaves, right? Know anybody else with a crown of autumn leaves? So here we, you know, we meet them. Um, we meet them uh, 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 in. Uh, 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 so when Bilbo meets the Elven King, he's got he's got a crown just like Tin Welland. Um and there's much more. But now, before I proceed down this road, let me make one thing perfectly clear. Some people want to go a step further and say the Elven King and the Hobbit is Thingol or is Tin Welland, right? That basically. You know, because remember, the Hobbit is the you know the, the the this other stuff he's left it behind decades ago now. Um, by the time he's writing the Hobbit, and he's um, not you know, so maybe he's given up on publishing it. Anyway, he's going to use this stuff. It's taking place in in the same world. There's evidence that in Tolkien's mind, it's taking place in the same world. So uh, so this this it actually it it's actually is Thingol that he meets. He's not named right, but it actually is Thingol. Um, I disagree with that completely. Um, I think that that goes significantly too far. Um, I refuse to think of the Elven King in The Hobbit as being Tinwellant or Thingol because what's he missing? What does he not have in The Hobbit? Who is conspicuous by being absent in The Hobbit? Yes, he's exactly Kate and Ethan and Karina. He's got no wife. There's no reference to his wife or James, his daughter. Exactly, and I mean that the 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 joining of Thingol and Melian or Tin Welland and Gwendolyn. That is the essential part. I mean, that's like the old one of the oldest things about his story, right? I mean, it is absolutely fundamental to that character. So, like, might he have a queen and it never be mentioned? Sure, it's possible that Tolkien was like, oh yeah, it's totally, you know, Tinwell or Thingol or whatever, but I'm, uh, you know, I just, I, I won't even mention Melian. Like, I, just, to me, this is, this is sort of inconceivable um, that, because, uh, I mean, that, the, you know, the women folk of Artenor define Artenor, um, and the story of Tinwell of a Tinwell without um, uh, the story of Tin Wellant without Gwendolyn is not the story of Tin Wellant anymore. Um, even if he had been given that name, it's a different story now. It's a different character. I don't care if it's named the same thing, but and, and it isn't. Um, you know, it reminds me of the 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 comment that uh, that Tolkien made in um, on fairy stories when he's talking about the way that folklorists, the kind of errors that he accuses folklorists of making when they talk about stories and traditional stories. And he gives that example from Red Riding Hood. And he, he, he says that, you know, he gives the example of how a folklorist would consider one version of Red Riding Hood uh, uh, in which uh, the woodsmen kill the, the wolf and the other version of the story uh, in which the wolf eats Red Riding Hood at the end as the same story, right? Yeah, I mean, they're both they're just variants, of the same story. Um, and the argument he makes is that they're not the same. They are, in fact, profoundly different stories in where they go and what they do. Yes, they're using the same elements. Yes, they're sort of based, you know, they're working with the same apparatus. But if you call them the same story, you're being really tone deaf, right? And that's exactly the same argument that I would make here. An elven king who has no divine wife is not the story 
of Tinwellant or Thingol. Howsoever else it might be like them, you know, he might still have a red cape, but he's not Little Red Riding Hood. If that is, you know, if 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 the story is uh, is changed to that extent. Um, anyway, so when I talk about the similarities and the parallels here, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to argue that Tin Willant is a character in The Hobbit. Just that, but I do think it's pretty obvious to me that Tolkien is blatantly recycling the Tin Willant material and using it in The Hobbit. Um, many of you, I know some of you have already alluded to, and many of you, I'm sure, uh, can remember some of these passages in The Hobbit which point most directly to this stuff. Um, here's... Uh, one passage you may remember. If the Elf King had a weakness, it was for treasure, especially for silver and white gems. And though his hoard was rich, he was ever eager for more, since he had not as yet as great a treasure as other Elf Lords of old. His people neither mined nor worked metals nor jewels, nor did they bother much with trade or with tilling the earth. All this was well known to every dwarf, though Thorin's family had had nothing to do with the old quarrel I have spoken of. This is a moment in The Hobbit which is a little bit odd. There are several moments in The Hobbit that are a little bit odd. That is a little bit odd if you're trying to think of the Middle-earth works, right? You take The Hobbit and The Silmarillion and The Lord of the Rings together, right? And you try to sort of imagine the consistent full story of Middle-earth as those books together depict it, right? And there are several things which are kind of uncomfortable, that is, ways in which The Hobbit doesn't really comfortably fit in with the rest of them. Um, you know, some of the really obvious things, like the depiction of the stone trolls and the talking purse and the stone giants, right? But, but even beyond that, there are moments like this where it's like, you know, okay, the elf king with a weakness for treasure who's all like, I don't have as great a treasure as other elf lords, you know, who's like so, got some kind of... Elf Lord's scorebook, right? And is, like, comparing, and it just doesn't seem to fit. I mean, then you read the Silmarillion, right? And you're like, that's not how they act. I mean, yeah, they are they have other problems, but we don't see anybody keeping a scorecard like that. Thingol doesn't do that. Um, yeah, Ethan, it does sound like an Elf Lord with an inferiority complex. It seems really strange and like it doesn't fit in with the rest of Tolkien's stories. Oh, wait, but it does fit in with the Book of Lost Tales version of Tin Willant. And here I'm reaching back for a minute, um, because uh, uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, here I'm, I'm, I'm reaching back for a minute to the story of Turambar, a passage uh, f uh, from there that I wanted to wait until now to talk about, because it fits in with this. Um Oh, it's long. I'm going to skip a little bit here. Uh, this passage is longer than I expected. Um, let me let me start here. Uh, now the folk of Tinwellant were of the woodlands and had scant wealth, yet they did yet did they love fair and beauteous things, gold and silver and gems, as do all the Eldar, but the Noldoli most of all. Nor was the king of other mind in this, and his riches were small, save it be for that glorious Silmaril that many a king had given all his treasury contained if he might possess it. Okay, so he has that, right? Um, here's uh, here's Tin Willant with the, uh, he's got no treasure but the pearl of great price, so I guess that's okay. Therefore did Tin Willant answer, Now shalt thou have aid, O Mavwin, most steadfast, and openly I say it to thee, it is not for hope of freeing Turin thereby that I grant it to thee, for such hope I do not see in this tale, but rather the death of hope. Yet it is a truth that I have need and desire of treasury, and it may be that such shall come to me by this venture, yet half of the spoil shalt thou have, O Mavwen, for the memory of Urin and Turin, or else thou shalt ward it for Nianori thy daughter. Um, notice, the Hobbit lines are adapted like straight out of this. Um, uh, uh, and his riches were small, you know, nor was the king of other mind in this, and those riches were small. Um, you can see the, the register is different, right? You know, so, so again, we go back to the, go back to the Hobbit versions and, you know, uh, 
that uh, you know, since he had not yet as great a treasure as other elf lords of old, right? That's told in Hobbit register, not Book of Lost Tales register, which is even more archaic and sort of lofty than uh, than uh, than even the published Silmarillion is. Um, but 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 there it is, right? Um, this is this is Tin Wellent talking. So Tin Wellent in in the Book of Lost Tales sounds exactly like the Elven King. Uh, in uh, in in the Hobbit, um, with his desire for treasury, and notice also something else. Uh, those of you who've read my Hobbit book may remember that I made kind of a big deal about the fact that the Elven King marches out with his army to go claim the treasure. Right? The Elven King marches out with an army to claim treasure here too. Now, in his defense. Tinwellant in the Book of Lost Tales still has a live dragon to cope with when he sends out uh, a small expeditionary army uh, to go out to a dragon horde and uh, see if he can obtain treasure. Um, but uh, uh, but still, anyway, that that kind of the path of the story is sort of already trodden there in the Book of Lost Tales, and we see, as so often happens, Tolkien retaining the shape of a story that he's already told, even though he's placing it in a very different uh, context and with some different kinds of implications, but not a hundred percent different implications. Um, there's, of course, another passage, just the passage just earlier on in that same paragraph that doubtless, again, you guys were all remembering from The Hobbit. In ancient days, they, the elves, of course, had had wars with some of the dwarves, whom they accused of stealing their treasure. It is only fair to say that the dwarves gave a different account, and said that they only took what was their due, for the elf king had bargained with them to shape his raw gold and silver, and had afterwards refused to give them their pay. Now, if you were like me, when you first read the Silmarillion, you said, Oh, that's the old quarrel that we're talking about. And you get to the destruction of Doriath and the and the the Elven King and the 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 you know the dwarves coming in. And the, I was like, oh, okay, that's the story he's referring to, right? That's the old quarrel from the Hobbit. That's really cool. And then you go back and read it again, and are like, wait a second, that's not how it happens, actually, right? It's 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 not how it happens in the Silmarillion, right? You know, and I remember being puzzled. I'm like, to shape his raw gold and silver? I'm like, well, no. It wasn't about shaping his raw gold and silver. The, he did, Thingol didn't have any raw gold or silver to shape. He had them put the Silmaro into the Nauglifring. It was it. He had, like, one contract for these dwarves, right? They had one job. He had a he had a, he had had a a, a, a a completed Nauglamir, right? And he had a Silmaro. And he's like, hook me up, right? Connect these two things together. And they were like, okay. So I was, so, you know, I, I was like so near and yet so far, right? I, I, it seems that this is probably what he's referring to. I see nothing else that this could refer to. But it doesn't actually fit the Silmarillion story. But it exactly fits the story of the Nauglifring. That is precisely what happens in the Nauglifring, right? The horde of... of of Glorand that everyone's fighting over is chiefly raw and unworked gold. And it is precisely to shape that raw gold and silver that the dwarves come uh, and do their craftsmanship and the uh, the making of the the, Naugla, the Nauglifring, as it's called there, um, is is sort of the the special bonus, right? I mean it's the it's the <laughs> well, I was about to call it like the crown jewel, but it's kind of an awkward metaphor under the circumstances. Um, anyway, it's it's uh, it's it's um, it just one. It's the the pinnacle of all of these different pieces that the dwarves are making. But again, but that's exactly. It's 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 so clear when you read the Nauglifring and then you go back to the Hobbit and you read this. It's like that's ob- this is obviously the version of the story that Tolkien had in mind when he wrote that passage. It makes total sense. Um, and uh, okay, okay, and then there's more. Um, what are Thranduil's halls like? What do Thranduil's halls look like? 
Um, and you have to be careful in answering that question because we have clearly contradictory evidence about this. Um, Remember this conversation between Legolas and Gimli in The Lord of the Rings? This is when uh, Gimli is just beginning to wax poetic about the glittering caves after the Battle of Helm's Deep. Um, saying he would give pure, you know, dwarves would give pure gold to, to for a single glimpse. And I would give gold to be excused, said Legolas, and double to be let out if I strayed in. You have not, you have not seen, so I forgive your jest, said Gimli. But you speak like a fool. Do you think those halls are fair, where your king dwells under the hill in Mirkwood, and dwarves helped in their making long ago? They are but hovels compared with the caverns I have seen here, immeasurable halls, filled with an everlasting music of water that tinkles into pools, as fair as Kaledzarum in the starlight. What do we get from that? What picture does this give us of, of, of the halls of Thranduil? What is the subtext? Of course, he's not describing Gimli's. It's not Gimli's describing the halls of the Elfin King, right? But we are clearly being given information, right? What is the the context of this here? What are they like? He wouldn't even be making this uh, statement if certain things weren't true of them, right? Are they nice? The halls of the Elfin King. What do we learn? What do we learn about the halls of Thranduil from this passage? One very definite thing. Who made them? Yes, good, Sarah. We learn that the dwarves helped make them. That is one of the most... uh, one of the most plain facts that we learn from this. So they were delved, at least in part, by the dwarves. The fact that he says dwarves dwarves helped in their making suggests the dwarves did not do all the work. Um, but nevertheless, dwarves helped in the delving. Okay. Um, be careful. Several of you are sort of suggesting that they seem sort of simple. No, I don't think so. I think the implication is that they're quite splendid. Because Gimli is using them as a standard of comparison. He is trying to convey how incredibly awesome the, ca- the glittering caves of Aglarond are. And so he goes to Legolas as a, t- as a, you know, as a, as a, a sort of a, a, a touchstone for this conversation. He says to Legolas, you think your father's halls are fair, right? They're but hovels compared with this, right? If the Elven King actually was living in a hovel... He wouldn't make this comparison, right? Um, I mean, instead, he would be saying something like, well, the cave you live in is a freaking dump, so you wouldn't know a good cave if you, you, know, if you fell into it. That, but that's not what he's saying to Legolas, right? He's like, you, you probably think... You know, the, 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 the implication under Gimli's words here are, you probably think that the caves that your father lives in are quite splendid. And they are quite splendid, but compared to these caves, they're nothing, right? Um... So the fact that we learn here is the dwarves helped to build them. The implication of how Gimli talks about them is that they're really quite impressive. Nothing compared to the Glittering Caves of Aglaron, but that's the whole point that he's, uh, that he's, that he's making. Um, uh, but this is in The Lord of the Rings. This is not what we hear in The Hobbit. Back to The Hobbit. Back to Chapter 9. A little bit earlier, the paragraph before the one we've been quoting. In a great cave, some miles within the edge of Mirkwood, on its eastern side, there lived at this time their greatest king, that is the elves, of course. Before his huge doors of stone, a river ran out of the heights of the forest and flowed on and out into the marshes at the feet of the high wooded lands. This great cave, from which countless smaller ones opened out on every side, wound far underground and had many passages and wide halls. But it was lighter and more wholesome than any goblin dwelling, and neither so deep nor so dangerous. In fact, the subjects of the king lived, mostly lived and hunted in the open woods, and had houses or huts on the ground and in the branches. The beaches were their favorite trees. The king's cave was his palace, and the strong place of his treasure, and the fortress of his people against their enemies. 
does sound awful rustic, doesn't it, Carita? Notice the implications of this description. See, I think most readers, most Tolkien fans, when they read this passage, fill in gaps here, right? They're thinking of, maybe they're thinking of Thranduil's halls in Minigroth, maybe they're thinking of Nargothrond, maybe they're just thinking about, you know, what we kind of learn about, uh, uh, about Thranduil in The Lord of the Rings. Um, you know, maybe now they're thinking about Lee Pace and his excellent eyebrows, I don't know. But, uh, they certainly, but many people, I think, don't really pay attention to this description, right? Um, yes, Carita, picture elves living in huts on the ground, <laughs> and the word hut is what not one you're used to thinking of in connection with elves, are you? These are wood elves, um... But anyway, in addition, yeah, Stephanie, notice, exactly, uh, 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 Stephanie points out that the compliment that's given to them there, more wholesome than a goblin dwelling, that's nice, right? Um, Michael, the description is similar to Bag End, but notice the differences. Bag End is never called a cave, it's a hole, right? But notice how, back back to paragraph one of The Hobbit, right? Um in a hole in the ground, right? Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole, right? Um, filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor a dirty, sandy hole uh, with nothing to sit down on or to eat. This was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort, right? So, that is, he says the word hole and realizes that we might have several different associations with hole, and he instantly goes through and says, toss aside all of your assumptions about what a hole is. Let me tell you, he describes the paneling and the, and, the, and the tile on the floor and everything else, right? To specify that this is not that kind of hole. He calls the Elven King's halls caves. And he doesn't qualify that. By cave, I'm, you know, um, by cave, I don't mean any rough goblin dwelling, but rather palatial, beautifully carven, no. He just calls it a great cave, and there are countless smaller caves opening out on every side, as if that's just naturally how the caves work. It's not even obvious that these caves are delved by anybody at all, actually, um, and that they seem rough. It's, we, we're given every reason, I think, here to, to picture rough caves, that you don't feel like you're going into a palace or anything constructed, but just into a network of caves. That seems to be the comparison underlying um, the clarification. Again, you go down, you know, this great cave there on line five of this paragraph. This great cave from which countless smaller ones open out on every side, wound far underground and had many passages and wide halls, but it was lighter and more wholesome than any goblin dwelling, and neither so deep nor so dangerous. Those are our only qualifications, right? We don't get the not a nasty, dirty, wet hole, nor a sandy... No, we get... It, they're not as deep and dangerous. They're much lighter and nicer. So don't imagine like a dark, creepy cave like the Goblin's Cave. This is a much nicer kind of cave. But it's still a cave. Um, but you say, no, hang on. Yeah, no, it's not convinced yet? Check this out. Bilbo going down through the secret door to visit Smaug for the first time. The, scar the stars were coming up behind him in a pale sky, barred with black, when the hobbit crept through the enchanted door and stole into the mountain. It was far easier going than he expected. This was no goblin entrance or rough wood elf's cave. It was a passage made by dwarves at the height of their wealth and skill, straight as a ruler, smooth-floored and smooth-sided, going with a gentle, never-varying slope direct to some distant end in the blackness below. This was no rough wood elves cave. By contrast, it was a passage made by dwarves, which means it is straight as a ruler, smooth floored, and smooth sided. These seem to be things that the rough wood elves caves were not. Um, this is the kind. This appears to be the kind of hall that Tinwillant lives in, also. I don't have a corresponding passage where his halls are described with the same kind of detail. Um, but the same word cave is used of where he lives several times. And you'll remember, um, notably, 
the fact that when Baron is first brought before the king, remember one of the primary different. You know, we 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 did the side by side on those scenes, right? The Silmarillion version and the Book of Lost Tales version of that scene when Baron is brought before the king for the first time. Um, remember the Silmarillion goes out of its way to say that the 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 splendor of Menegroth and the glory of Thingol were very great, right? And Baron is overwhelmed by the splendidness of everything that he sees. He's awed by his surroundings. Baron in the Book of Us Tales is not awed by his surroundings. Um, that's something added later because the idea that the king of Artenor, soon to become Doriath, um, is already a very powerful, established, and sufficiently wealthy uh, elf lord belongs to a later, very soon, but later, version of this story. But again, in The Hobbit, there we are. I am pretty convinced that it is the Book of Lost Tales, Tin Wellent, that's in Tolkien's mind when he's writing The Hobbit. That that is the story. That this, story, this, the, this Nauglifring version, um, or rather, this version of the Nauglifring story, is the thing, that is the storyline that Tolkien is recycling when he writes The Hobbit. Um, now, uh, um, let's... Um, Exactly, Brianna. Brianna says, I, I remember there being a fairly detailed Menegroth description in the Lay of Lathian. Um, yes, exactly, but that is later. That's what he's going to do after this. Um, it's within a decade. It's the next version of the story. And that is the moment that I was just referring to, when very soon afterwards, this idea of splendor and wealth is going to be added to the Elven King. Um, uh, you, you would recognize the description of the halls of the Elven King in the Lay of Lathian. It goes something like, uh, let's see, a king there was on carven stone and many pillared halls, uh, uh, on carven throne in many pillared halls of stone. Um, the poem about Durin that Gimli sings in The Lord of the Rings, long passages are taken of it, are taken word for word from the description of Thingol's character and his palace in the Lay of Lathian, which is kind of mind-bending when that happens. Um, but, uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, so Brianna, that does happen, but that happens after the Book of Lost Tales version, not in the book. So again, this is why I think it's the connections between the Hobbit Elven King and Thingol slash Tin Willant um, are obviously really strong, but the Book of Lost Tales version is like the only one he could be because he's no longer... We don't. We don't. We don't any longer have a king with the autumnal uh, leaf crown and uh, the rough caves and uh, the insufficient wealth. Uh, the Book of Lost Tales, Tin Wellant, is the only version of that king of which those things are true. Um. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um. But let's go and talk about the. I think since we're halfway through class, it's time to start talking about the major theme of uh, this story which is the curse, of course. Um, uh, it's, the, it's the biggest theme and sort of the most, I was going to say outdated, but as they know, the, that is the one that the story moves on from the most. Um, the one which seems most outdated in retrospect when you look at it from the later point of view, and that's the issue of the curse. So let's look at Meme's curse on the treasure. On a time, therefore, Urin led them to the caves of the Rodothlam. This is, again, back to the stuff that we get at the end of the story of Turambar. And behold, the orcs had fled therefrom at the death of Glorand, and one only dwelt there still, an old misshapen dwarf, who sat ever on the pile of gold, singing black songs of enchantment to himself. But none had come nigh till then to despoil him, for the terror of the drake lived longer than he, and none had ventured thither again, for dread of the very spirit of Glorand the worm. Now therefore, when those elves approached the dwarf... When those... Sorry... Now when those dwarves approached, the dwarf stood before the doors of the cave that was once the abode of Galweg, and he cried, What will ye with me, O outlaws of the hills? But Urin answered, We come to take what is not thine. Then said that dwarf, and his name was Meme, 
O Urin, little did I think to see thee, a lord of men, with such a rabble. Hearken now to the words of Meme the fatherless, and depart, touching not this gold no more than were it venomous fires. For has not Glorund lain long years upon it, and the evil of the drakes of Melka was on it, and no good can bring it can it bring to man or elf? But I, only I, can ward it, Meme the dwarf, and by many a dark spell have I bound it to myself. Then Urin wavered. But his men were wroth at that, so that he bid them seize it all, and Meme stood by and watched, and he broke forth into terrible and evil curses. Thereat did Urin smite him, saying, We came but to take what was not thine. Now for thy evil words we will take what is thine as well, even thy life. But Meme dying said unto Urin, Now elves and men shall rue this deed, and because of the death of Meme the dwarf shall death follow this gold so long as it remain on earth, and a like fate shall every part and portion share with the whole. That is the cursing of the treasure by Meme, which leads to the entire later story. Um, try to forget about the later Meme, uh, you'll notice that the sort of main thing that we get, um, the killing of Meme is obviously a great deal more justifiable um, when Hurin kills him uh, later on. Um, Urin does not really come across very well here in this story, um, but um, I mean, he he when he comes and he when he says, "I come to take what is not thine." He seems to be referring to basically the gold that Turin deserves for being the Dragon Slayer. Everybody agrees that the Dragon Slayer is entitled to a portion, a significant portion, of the gold. Oh yeah, Bard says that too, doesn't he? Um, Bard, you know, when Bard very discreetly, I think, with uh, very appropriate. Uh, humility uh, says, you know, I, I, I'm the slayer of the, you know, I killed the dragon uh, and delivered the treasure uh, that you now claim. Is that not a matter of which we might speak? Right? That's a, that's a, that's a fairly indirect way to say, um, I come to take what is not thine. Right? Um, it it is rightly mine. Um, uh, yeah. Sarah asks, should we try to forget the dwarf in the Volsunga saga, uh, Envari? No, no, we shouldn't try to forget Envari, um, as Envari is a great deal more relevant to meme the fatherless than, uh, you know, uh, Turin's meme from, from later on um, is. One thing that we see from this guy, you know, who is this meme guy? Uh, he seems to be a pretty big deal. Um, he calls himself Meme the Fatherless. Now, he's the only one who calls himself that, right? Um, it would be even more impressive if the other dwarves that we meet later on were like, rally around the memory of Meme the Fatherless! Then I'd be even more impressed by Meme the Fatherless. Um, but, uh, but anyway, uh, it, he uh, seems to... now. Theoretically, all dwarves might be fatherless at this point, but I don't think that's... He seems to mean something more than that uh, in this uh, in this description. But um, but anyway, certainly he seems to he seems to be a big deal. If we take his meme, the fatherless, literally, he seems to suggest that he has like a Durin esque role here. That he's like you know one of the fathers of the dwarves. Um, seems possible that that's, in fact, who and what Meme was. Um, certainly, his cursing is extremely potent. So, uh, he's not just a random, you know, petty dwarf cursing the guy. This guy, whatever were the, uh, the, with the dark enchantments that he's muttering, uh, when they come in and find him, um, uh, again, Apparently, it's the Black Songs of Enchantment. There it is. The Black Songs of Enchantment that he's singing to himself appear to work pretty darn well, uh, because his curse on this treasure has enormous effects on lots and lots and lots of very powerful creatures. I mean, it's it's it sort of 
alters the whole course of the rest of the story of the first age. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty remarkably potent curse. Um, but anyway, yeah, we are supposed to be thinking... I, I mean, I certainly think we're supposed to be thinking of the Volsunga saga here. Uh, th- this this In talking about the curse on the gold, Tolkien is doing a, a very Norse thing, right? Um, he is... The the gold of Glorand here um, basically becomes like the gold of Fafnir, the gold of the Nibelungs um, in uh, in Norse uh, tradition. Um, and I'm not going to tell the whole story of the Nibelungs because it's quite a long story. Um, but basically, it begins with gold that's stolen from a dwarf who is killed and has his gold taken from him. And he curses that gold and says that it will be the bane of anybody who claims it. It is the gold which then is... So then it's brought to this guy who has three sons. And one of his sons, Fafnir, kills him and claims the gold for himself. And Fafnir, who was a dwarf or human, I think a dwarf, uh, becomes a dragon. And he becomes the father of dragons, Fafnir, the great Fafnir. Um, is sort of transmogrified into a dragon through his lust for the gold. Um, and then he, he, you know, broods and, and sleeps on the pile of gold after that. Um, until he's then killed by Sigurd, who stabs him up underneath as he's down in a pit, uh, and, uh, uh, and eats uh, his... Uh, he cooks his heart and eats it so he can understand the speech of birds afterwards. Remember that business uh, uh, from the stuff about dragons in the Tale of Turambar? And uh, and then of course the treasure does go on to cause wars and and everything and and uh, and brings destruction to almost everybody who touches it, and nobody lived happily ever after. Um, so yeah, we have a really uh, significant parallel. Um, so we have in this story, which he re- you know which I've been arguing he's recycling in the Hobbit. Uh, he is within this story very heavily recycling uh, these. Norse elements. Now, he's not just following it slavishly. Notice, for instance, the very significant alteration in cause and effect between dragon and gold, right? Um, Part of, you know, Meme himself suggests that part of the potency of the curse on this gold comes from the dragon, right? Has not Glorand lain long years upon it, and the evil of the drakes of Melko is on it, and no good can it bring to man or elf. Because, you know, you can't underestimate the effect of gold over which a dragon has long brooded, right? That, of course, is a line from The Hobbit. Um, uh, so, so Tolkien shifts things around, right? Instead of having the dragon himself created by the gold and his desire for this pre-cursed gold, or it's cursed before Fafnir gets it. In fact, what happens to Fafnir, both in his murder of his father and in his transformation, and, of course also in his own death, we see the curse on the gold being played out, right? Um, Its effects, you know, it it totally wrecks Fafnir from one end to to the other. Um, uh, This this curse does. That's not how Tolkien construes it, right? Again, the cause and effect is different um, in that relationship between dragon and gold. Um, But of course you also see where the story of Eustace comes from, by the way, is a little freebie uh, in here, right? Lewis uh, had read many of the same books that Tolkien had. Anyhow, um, so we can see him invoking this. So that this the business with the the sinister, solitary dwarf laying his curse upon the treasure that's going to bring destruction to everybody, and connected with a dragon brooding on it. We kind of we're given a framework here for where we are, and and it's it's a very Norse, a very Nibelung. Uh, sort of framework in which to understand what's happening. But let's pause for a second in our discussion of the curse to talk about dwarves for a second. You remember we 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 discussed dwarves a little bit and the way in which the dwarves in the Book of Lost Tales are different uh, from the way we're, no- we're accustomed to thinking about dwarves in the rest of Tolkien's writings, certainly in The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. Um... Uh, but just adding to that discussion from last time and refreshing it because it was a heck of a long time ago, um, we have this passage from this story. The Naugloth are a strange race, and none know surely whence they be. 
and they serve not Milko nor Manwe, and reck not for elf or man, and some say that they have not heard of Iluvatar, or hearing disbelieve. Howbeit, in crafts and sciences, and in the knowledge of the virtues of all things that are in the earth and under the water, none excel them. Yet they dwell beneath the ground in caves and tunneled towns, and aforetime Nogrod was the mightiest of these. Old are they, and never comes a child among them, nor do they laugh. They are squat in stature, and yet are strong, and their beards reach even to their toes, but the beards of the Indrafangs are the longest of all, and are forked, and they bind them about their middles when they walk abroad. All these creatures have men called dwarves, and say that their crafts and cunning surpass that of the gnomes in marvelous contrivance, but of a truth there is little beauty in their works of themselves, for in those things of loveliness that they have wrought in ages past, such renegade gnomes as was Ufethin have ever had a hand. Um, no, Yana, there is no version of the Aule Dwarf chapter in the Lost Tales. There's no glimpse of it. The dwarves are all... The dwarves are in the category of creatures who are called the, the children of Melka. Um, they seem to be primarily, more or less, evil creatures. Though we... Uh, we see them operating basically as sort of free agents, right? Um, they're kind of neutrals in, this, in the Book of Lost Tales story. They trade equally with the elves and the orcs, right? They don't care. Um, uh, this business about them not, them being crafty, but not craftsmen in the way that Thorin and company in The Hobbit are, right? The rapturous descriptions of the beauty of their works of hand in the song that they sing for Bilbo in Bag End, not the Chip of the Glasses song, the other one, um, that has no parallel in this early version of the dwarves. In fact, we're told precisely the contrary of that. They don't really make beautiful things. They don't really care about beauty. They made good quality craftsmanship, and they make extreme, they make marvelous contrivances, uh, and they're very cunning, but they don't make beautiful things. Um, and they are more interested in trade. They're, they're more... Uh, I don't know. Vulgar, in that sense. I think perhaps Tolkien would say. Um, they, uh, they're, they're more about the bottom line than they are about the craftsmanship itself. Um, and, yeah, Branna, they, they don't have any children. Right? Isn't that, isn't that striking? And, of course, Christopher Tolkien refers, and I think he's very cautious here. Christopher Tolkien is so much more cautious than I am, um, which is probably really smart, but um, Christopher points to that passage in uh, uh, in Appendix B, the one that uh, Peter Jackson actually put in the extended edition of the films um, and, and put into Gimli's mouth, you remember? Um, when he says, you know, that there, are, there are some who say that dwarves have no children, right? You know, there, there are foolish tales among men uh, that, that there are no chil- that d- dwarves have no children, but just, you know, th- th- that there are no dwarf women, but that the, dwarf, uh, the dwarves just emerge out of the stone, right? Um, and Christopher Tolkien r- suggests that, um, you know, it might be that this, that Tolkien was thinking of this passage when he wrote that. Um, I think it's more than probable. I think it, it's really likely. Um, or rather, I think it's more than possible. I think it's very probable. Um, that's exactly the kind of thing that Tolkien does, right? When you, when he alludes to something that he wrote earlier on and revised, right, and said, like, some have said this, right, but the truth is this. When it's something that he said before and, and, uh, and changed his mind about, I love it when he does that. Um, but, uh, uh, but anyway, so he, uh, um, uh, so, so this is the dwarves don't think of Thorin and company because they're not exactly the same. Um, but at the same time, they're not completely different either. Remember that description that we get? You know, there it is. Dwarves are not heroes, right? Um, but, uh, oh, what's the adjective? I'm forgetting the line. I'm trying to quote the Hobbit from memory here, um, uh, but but what practical folk with a uh, um, with a with with a high opinion of the value of money, right? Um, 
that passage where it says, you know, they, they, they intended to pay, you know, this can be said in their defense that they intended to, they intended to pay Bilbo really handsomely for the work that he was doing, but they hired him to do a nasty job for them, and when it came to it, they didn't mind him doing it. Um, there are certainly elements of Thorin and company that are a lot like the dwarfs in the Silmarillion. They're much nicer, um, but they're, uh, you can still see some of the some of their roots here. Um, but uh, anyway, let's get back to the curse. Now were the elves of the wood in turn displeased, uh, and this is uh, so. This is now we go back to the Urin's men. Urin's left, and Urin's men are still there, and are like, dude, what what gives? We we actually wanted this treasure for ourselves, right? And Tin Wellant has said, go and take as much as you can hold in your two hands and get out, right? Um, and the elves are looking on because Orin's men are totally doing the, like, guests at Bilbo party trick, right? Where they come in the front gate and then they come back around and come in a second time to get a second present, right? It's exactly what these guys are doing. Um, now were the elves of the wood in turn displeased, who long had stood nigh gazing on the gold. But the wild folk did as they were bid, and yet more. For some went into the horde twice and thrice, and angry cries were raised in that hall. Then would the woodland elves hinder them of their thieving, and a great dissension arose, so that, through, so that though the king would stay them, none heeded him. Then did those outlaws, being fierce and fearless folk, draw swords and deal blows about them, so that soon there was a great fight, even upon the steps of the high seat of the king. Doughty were, these, were those outlaws, and great wielders of sword and axe from their warfare with orcs, so that many were slain ere the king, seeing that peace and pardon might no longer be summoned a host of his warriors, and, the, and those outlaws, being bewildered with the stronger magics of the king, and confused in the dark ways of the halls of Tinwillant, you know, because it's like a cave, <clears throat> were all slain, fighting bitter, bitterly. But the king's hall ran with gore, and the gold that lay before his throne, scattered and spurned by trampling feet, was drenched with blood. Thus did the curse of Meme the Dwarf begin its course, and yet another so sorrow, sown by the Noldoli of old in Valinor was come to fruit. So how does the curse function? What do we learn here? What do we see? What is the what is the curse of meme about? The curse of meme is being involved on both sides, right? Both the greed of the men who are unwilling to take what is still I mean going out with as much gold as you can carry in your two hands that's still a lot actually. I mean you can live especially in a in a, uh, you know, in an economy like this, you can live pretty well on that much gold. Um, but, nevertheless, they're greedy for more, right? And the elves are objecting. I mean, like, seriously, it's this huge, it's a very large quantity of gold, but, like, two handfuls of gold? No, let's kill them, right? So, I mean, the, the tensions, the way that this plan, you know, the king's attempt to establish peace backfires, um, and blood, sh and, the, and that marvelous image of the blood being spattered on the gold. Now, Sarah King makes a wonderful observation here. One wonders if the curse wasn't really necessary. Sounds a lot like ordinary greed. Yeah, doesn't it, though? Doesn't it, though? Um, this, it does seem to be connected, but that we're told, and I, I think we have to believe the narrator when he tells us that the curse of meme is beginning its course here. Um, the greed seems to be, in fact, what I guess the curse is, right? Um, Ethan says it's interesting that Tin Wellant is not the greedy one in this scene. Yes, and Ethan, actually, I think it's one of the reasons why his greed later on makes me, like, more uncomfortable, because uh, for a while he seems like he's the one who's, you know, he's not bothered so much. Um, but, uh, um, but anyway, Sarah, back to what you were saying. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, it seems to be that this talk about the curse is that the curse has a, I want to say very carefully, sort of semi-allegorical significance, right? Um, it's almost as if the description of the curse is a way of talking about greed. 
or I think I what I the way I'd really say it is a different way that the curse of meme gives us a different way to understand what greed really is it's not that these people under this uh, I mean you could say that the people these people who are under the curse of meme are acting like normal greedy people right or you could say when normal people act greedily they are acting like people cursed by meme right um, that it gives us a kind of a mythic framework in which to contextualize greed. Um, and golly, isn't that kind of how it works in The Hobbit too, with the dragon sickness? Um, dwarves are particularly prone to dragon sickness, which kind of sounds like another way of saying that dwarves are greedy, right? Um, are greedy of wealth. Um, but that same kind of semi-allegorical sense, uh, you know, the reference to the master coming down with dragon sickness later on, right? He's contracting dragon sickness from the gold. There is, we do not get the sense in The Hobbit that there was an actual magic spell about the gold which has infected the master. <clears throat> it's, that seems to be, especially the reference to the master, in, in, at the very end, I mean, uh, seems to be a relatively transparent kind of semi-allegorical way of describing greed. Just sort of a poetic way to describe the fact that the Master was really greedy and succumbed to greed. The story of the curse of meme upon the gold works in the same kind of way, but it, it gives a, a much more sort of mythic story of greed. Or sort of explanation of greed in this other way. Do you see what I mean by that? Um, uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Sarah is uh, suggesting that perhaps uh, maybe the film depiction of Thorin kind of overdid it with the, de the depiction of the dragon sickness. And you know what, Sarah? You might be onto something there. I totally agree. Um, but, uh, uh, anyway, let's, let's get more of the, uh, more of the, um, oh, wait, wait, last thing before we move on from this passage. Notice that rider that he throws in at the end there? The way in which he's trying to connect the cursive meme to the larger story, and you know, in the text is a footnote after this passage, in which Christopher emphasizes that that last bit, and yet another sorrow sown by the Noldoli of old in Valinor was come to fruit, is a later addition. Right? Tolkien spliced that in later on, as he's trying to integrate this story more fully into the larger trajectory of the Lost Tales. Right? Um, now, I think. In context, again, this is a, it's another moment that seems to me kind of clumsy. I'm like, how is this another sorrow sown by the Noldoli of old? I mean, what do the Noldoli have to do with this, exactly? I mean, the Noldoli aren't real heavily involved in this story of Meme and his cursed treasure and the fight before Tin Moen's throne. Um, but, but again, you can see him trying to... Now, certainly... Ufethin's betrayal, now that's a Noldoli thing, right? Um, uh, but, uh, but but sort of not quite yet. Anyway, we sort of see him doing it. Um, you know, Kate Neville says, it seems like greed was later extended to possessiveness for the works of one own, one's own hand, thinking of Ale and Feanor and Turgon. Um, yeah, yeah, that, it's, it, that's, that's sort of broadened there. Um, but... Um, Oh yeah, James says, isn't that why he changed Orden's outlaws from men to Noldor? That's quite possible. Yeah, and remember the outlaws here? He waffled back and forth, and I can't even remember where it ended up in this version of the story, if the outlaws were Noldor or were um, were men. Um, James, that does explain how this works, and if if it if that's correct... I'm not 100% sure if the manuscript bears this out, but um, if it's correct that he changed 
Urin's companions from men to Nol Doli at the same time that he adds this sentence about it's another sorrow sown by the Nol Doli of old, then that makes sense. I mean, James, I like that idea. I mean, that certainly seems to hold together. Um, and especially since, as I said, it doesn't seem like the Nol Doli are otherwise really involved in this. However, I'd still say it's not awful satisfying still, right? I mean, like, you know, another sorrow sown by the Nol Doli well, I mean, yeah, but again, this just seems a little hard to pin on the Noldoi. Um But anyhow, again, we can see him sort of connecting it in. But the one thing that I would say about this, though, is um, uh, it kind of makes you think about the Curse of Mandos in a slightly new context, doesn't it? Um, that is, the sense of the Noldoli being cursed and having this curse follow them is uh, less strong in the Book of Lost Tales than it is in the published Silmarillion. As this other curse sort of dies down, the dominant curse that keeps, you know, the only, the real curses that are the central. Um, sort of plot ele- you know, that, that are central plot elements in the Silmarillion story is the curse of Mandos and the, like the curse of of Morgoth on Hurin's family, for instance. Um, so, and I think it's kind of interesting uh, to kind of go back, and I think we can see again, in, in a sense, again, it's almost like Tolkien still sort of recycling those elements. He's taking it away. He's he's kind of. He removes the sort of straight-up Norse mythology, Nibelung version of the story of the dead dwarf cursing the dragon treasure, which then brings destruction wherever it goes. Um, he, he kind of vacates that story, but he doesn't lose the idea of this broader curse um, that really kind of dominates the story. And, but it's, it's diffused, and it really moves up the chain. Um, from meme to Mandos is a pretty big jump, you have to admit. Um, but um, but let's uh, let's keep going. The curse, of course, takes Tin Willent in the M in the end. All right. But Ufethin said not, shunning the bright eyes of Gwendolyn. This is, of course, when Ufethin comes in um, with his invading army. Um, but Ufethin said not, shunning the bright eyes of Gwendolyn. Wherefore she said anew, Get thee now gone with thy foul orcs, because of course this Nolo has brought orcs in with him, lest in wellant coming repay thee bitterly. Then at last did Ufethin answer, and he laughed, but ill at ease. He looked not at the queen, but he said, listening to a sound without, Nay, but already he is come. Already is he come. And behold, now Gladur entered now, and a host of the dwarves were about him, but he bore the head of Tinwellant crowned and helmed in gold. But the necklace of all wonder was clasped about the throat of, Na- of, of now Gladur. Then did Gwendolen see in her heart all that had befallen, and how the curse of the gold had fallen on the realm of Artenor, and never has she danced nor sung since that dark hour. But now Gladur bid gather all things of gold or silver or of precious stones, and bear them to Nogrod. And whatso remains of goods or folk may the orcs keep, or slay as they desire. Yet the lady Gwendolen, king, queen of Artenor, shall fare with me. Then said Gwendolen, thief and murderer, child of Melko, yet art thou a fool, for thou canst not see what hangs over thine own head. By reason of the anguish of her heart was her sight grown very clear, and she read by her fey wisdom the curse of meme, and much of what would yet betide. Um... First of all, I mean, man, that scene where he brings Tin Wellen's head crowned with gold, right, uh, in on a platter, uh, nay, but already he has come. I mean, dang, that sounds like downright Game of Thrones, doesn't it? Um, yikes. That's a really creepy scene that gets cut out later on. I have to say, I really kind of like that scene, though. Um, but, uh, but anyway... It's, I mean, it's really awful. We don't get anything quite that awful uh, in the published Silmarillion, uh, certainly in this story. Um, but, uh, and them being allied with orcs and stuff. Notice the even-handedness of the curse, right? It's not just a curse against the enemies of dwarves. 
even the dwarves who claim the treasure are going to get hit by the by the curse of meme uh the curse of meme is just on on the treasure at all this treasure will now bring destruction to everybody uh who sees it um and uh so we have Tinwellian's doom, Ufethin's doom, the dwarves' doom, everybody's doom, all wrapped up in this one curse, right? It's extremely profound uh, in its impact. Um, and, uh, by the way, I do believe Child of Melko to be used in a purely metaphorical sense here. Uh, well, that is not in the literal sense, like it, like I believe it was used of Gothmog the Balrog, that, you know, he's literally the offspring of, of Melko. But, you know, she does seem to be putting him in this in the category here. Um, but um, let's see. We get the the cursed finally, in a sense, coming to rest. But the waters of Aros flowed on forever above the drowned horde of Glorund, and so do still. For in after days, dwarves came from Nogrod and sought for it, and for the body of Naugladur. But a flood arose from the mountains, and therein the seekers perished. And so great now is the gloom and dread of that stony ford, that none seek the treasure that it guards, nor dare ever to cross the magic stream at that enchanted place. So, like the treasure of the Nibelungs, the gold of Meme ends up in a river, and nobody ever claims it. Uh, and those who try to seek for it are killed, and so the curse only rests. And I said the curse rests, sort of. I mean, in a sense, it doesn't rest, right? So long as anyone tries to... It, o it only stops affecting people when nobody possesses it and nobody tries, right? Um, uh, there's sort of the implication that if, like, Indiana Jones went looking for that treasure, he would reawaken the curse of meme, presumably. Um, but... Uh, yeah, James, it is like Smaug's final resting place, isn't it? Nobody daring to go and get the uh, the gems that had fallen out of his uh, out of his scales. Yeah, yeah, good. Um. Uh, so the the quest is really more the quest, the curse rather, sort of more quiescent. So we can see. I mean, the story of the curse of Meme is the dominant story here. Tolkien loved this idea of cursed dragon treasure. And, you know, we do see him carrying that over into The Hobbit and James, as you say, to the to the, to the the gems that sink to the bottom of the lake as well. Um, but, uh, but, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm being urged to speak more cautiously lest I give Hollywood ideas of a Lord of the Rings uh, and Indiana Jones crossover film. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> forget I said that. But, um, uh, anyway, so you can see how dominant this is. Now, again, just in case we think, like, well, but hang on a second. We don't, dwarves don't curse gold in The Hobbit, right? That, we don't, we don't see that kind of thing happening, do we? Do we? Oh, yes, we do. Do you remember dwarves laying curses on treasure? Singing black songs of... Yeah, exactly, Sarah, you've got it. After that they slept, for their night had been disturbed by Tom, Bert, and William, and they did nothing more till the afternoon. Then they brought up their ponies and carried away the pots of gold and buried them very secretly, not far from the track by the river, putting a great many spells over them just in case they ever had the chance to come back and recover them. Yes, and Ethan, you're right. Thorin does curse anyone who would keep the Arkenstone from him as well. And even the sense of, you know, remember the language that Thorin uses even in chapter 1, where he says their goal is to recover their treasure and to bring their curses home to Smaug. Um, if they can. Uh, dwarves are kind of a cursy people. They That's how they think, right? They've... Um, uh, and, uh, you know, he, remember he curses Azog's name, right? Yes, curse his name, when Gandalf brings him up um, uh, in chapter one. Um, that is, in fact, how they think. We, we, can, okay, we can see Thorin is, is, in a sense, you know, clearly a descendant of Meme the Fatherless here. Um, or again, like, this story is still kind of the mode which does lie in the background, um, of uh, of of the Hobbit, of course the dragon, 
Oh, though it kind of it kind of makes me wonder. Um, again, I've said many times, you know, in my book and on other occasions, especially in Riddles in the Dark context, that uh, the dwarves in The Hobbit seem kind of comically um, plan free when they come. Right, they have no plan for dealing with the dragon. Like they 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 come and they've got a live dragon on their hands. And they seem to they sit around and start talking about it as if they've never even had the conversation. How do we get rid of the dragon in order to claim the treasure? That seems to be why they've um, why they've gotten the um, the 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 burglar right so that they can steal treasure without killing the dragon because they don't know how to do that. But I wonder, you know, looking at the efficacy of dwarvish curses <laughs> in Meme's case. Uh, and how, you know, if there is sort of a memory of that, in a sense, within the context of the Hobbit story, so that basically Thorin has, like, said, he's basically cursed the gold, right? So, like, th- that it should be Smaug. Smaug has to- taken their gold from them and is holding a prisoner. May the treasure be Smaug's bane, right? Um, and it's like, they don't need any more plan, right? They've he's He's, like laid his curses on Smaug, he wants to bring his curses home, maybe he's not even speaking completely metaphorically there. I always assumed he was speaking metaphorically, right? That is, like, to bring our curses home to him, meaning we're going to turn words into actions, right? We've been saying, we've been cursing Smaug with words, but now we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna bring actions to Smaug, right? That's how I always understood that line before, but maybe not. Maybe they kind of think, like, we're, we're going to bring our, like we've we've laid a curse on him. Now we're gonna we're gonna sit and wa- watch and wait for the curses to to come. And indeed, it works out, right? Um, it's an inc- it's a <clears throat> it's a um, it's an unconventional plan. Maybe it's a plan though. No. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I. Brian Yoder asks, does Gimli speak any notable curses? None that I can recall. I don't recall Gimli cursing anybody. Um, And uh, I think that this is where you see the change. Um, Yes, the dwarves are very different in The Hobbit. I mean, there's major differences between Thorin and company and the dwarves that we see in the Book of Lost Tales. But I think that the difference in the next generation of dwarves, that is the difference that we see between the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings in dwarves, is is even more profound. Um, even the culture and values of Gimli are very different from what we see in the Hobbit. Um, there's none of that... I mean, Gimli betrays not a shadow of the sort of mercantile, really interesting and really interested in trade and money in the bottom line kind of perspective that we get even from Thorin and company. Um, so, um, so I think we, we, we can see a real, a real alteration, a real shift in the way that he conceives of dwarves, but it's there. It's not fundamentally, I think, between the Book of Lost Tales and The Hobbit, actually. Um, yeah, now, um, there's one other sub, I'm just going to stop talking about The Hobbit in a minute, but I I have one more comment left to make, um, and this was actually a passage that I, I didn't even think about until I was looking at passages, at some of these passages again, right before class, uh, just to have them fresh in my mind, and I noticed a new one that so I don't have it typed on a slide because I didn't I didn't notice it uh, quickly enough. Um, but um, but it's page two thirty three in my edition. It's the description of the death of Thingle of uh, Tin Wellet. Sorry. Um, let's see. Nonetheless, must ye know how even in the hour that Ufethan's host brake the palace and despoiled it, and other great and other companies as great and as terrible of the orcs and Indrafangs fell with death and fire upon all the realm of Tinwellent, behold, the brave hunt of the king were resting amid mirth and laughter, but who unstocked apart? 
Then suddenly were the woods filled with noise, and Huan bade aloud, but the king and his company were encircled with armed foes. Long they fought bitterly among the trees, and the Naugloth, for such were their foes, had great scathe of them, or ever they were slain. Yet in the end were they all foredone, and Mablung and the king fell side by side. But Nauglador it was, who swept off the head of Tinwellent after he was dead. For living he dared not so near to, he, he dared not so near to his bright sword, nor the axe of Mablung. What does that make you think of? Did you catch it? Behold the brave hunt of the king were resting amid mirth and laughter. Then suddenly were the woods filled with noise. So the woodland king the woodland king with uh, autumn leaves and his crown is there with his people feasting in the wood when suddenly dwarves burst upon them out of the woods and slaughter them. <laughs> it just, it's exactly like the wood elves in The Hobbit. It's like, no wonder they were so jumpy, <laughs> right? I mean, it seems in The Hobbit like a frightful overreaction, right? These, like, starving, unarmed dwarves uh, you know, sort of collapsing into the into the light while they're while they're there feasting. But holy cow, that's exactly how Tinwelling's death went down in the Nogafring. So I mean, yikes. Okay, I can you know I, I can understand why he decided to be a little bit proactive and make sure that this dwarf leader was not going to do any posthumous decapitation of any elven king today. Thank you very much. Um, uh, isn't that hilarious? I think it's... I mean, there are times like this where some of the recycling in Tolkien's work seems to approach the level of inside joke with himself. Right? I mean, like, the elves in The Hobbit react almost as if they had read the earlier drama, like they knew the story, which clearly doesn't exist, um, you know, as if they knew the story that they were based on, uh, and are responding to it. And I think that's, I think that's absolutely hysterical. Um, <laughs> Patrick says they were having bad deja vu, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly like that. But of course, like, the, there's no story continuity way in which that could possibly happen, right? Um, but it's like the it's like the the fictional elves in the Hobbit story have some kind of like deja vu memory of their previous life, right, Patrick? <laughs> their previous literary life in which they were killed by dwarves in exactly this circumstance. Uh, and uh, and it just sets them off. Um, I just I I, I, you know, so I didn't I didn't notice it. I I mean, I've read this story like three times in the last week, and I only just noticed it reviewing right before class, and I was like, holy cow, that's hysterical. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's my, that's my final thought about The Hobbit and the Naglifring. But I mean, honestly, you see how intricately, how intricately connected these stories are? Reading the story of the Naglifring answers so many of my questions about the Hobbit. I mean, the vast majority of the things in The Hobbit that kind of make me scratch my head and say, I, I don't get it. It doesn't seem to fit with what Tolkien says elsewhere. It fits with the Book of Lost Tales. It fits with, especially with the story of the Nalgrifing. So I find it really satisfying in that regard. Um, I need to let you go soon, but let's, I want to touch at least briefly on the two other things that I mentioned that I want to talk about, and that is the character of Gwendolyn and uh, the fates of Baron and Tenuvio. Um, Gwendolyn. First, we've looked at a little bit of Gwendol Gwendolyn. One more. This is her flight after the death of Tinwillant. Then did Nauglador in his triumph laugh... This is, this is immediately after the paragraph where they come in with the head. Then did Nauglador in his triumph laugh till his beard shook and bid seize her. Or he's going to take her home. I don't like to think about what his plans for Gwendolyn are here. Um, anyway, but none might do so, for as they came towards her, they remember they were asking for elf wives? 
earlier on, right? So it's not just me, right? Anyway, um, for as they came towards her, they groped as if in sudden dark, or stumbled, and fell tripping each the other. And Gwendolyn went forth from the places of her abode, and her bitter weeping filled the forest. Now did a great darkness fall upon her mind, and her counsel and lore forsook her, that she wandered she knew not whither for a great while, and this was by reason of her love for Tinwell and the king, for whom she had chosen never to fare back to Valinor and the beauty of the gods, dwelling always in the wild forests of the north. And now did there seem to her neither beauty nor joy, be it in Valinor or in the lands without. Many of the scattered elves in her wayward journeyings she met, and they took pity on her, but she heeded them not. Tales that had they told her, but she hearkened not overmuch, since Tinwellant was dead. We don't get any kind of glimpse of Melian like this, right? I mean, she's sad when Thingol dies, but Melian goes into what sounds like planned retirement at that point, right? Uh, you know, Thingol's dead, and she's she ha she has a little conference with Mablung, right? Let me give you some final instructions, then I'm out of here. Um, and uh, again, we get, but we don't get any of this darkness falling upon her, her her counsel and her lore forsaking her. Um, uh, the extremity of her grief is. Um, uh, uh, very, I mean, it's very profound. It's very significant. Um, uh, yeah, Brian, it is more sad and depressing than Melian's exit stage left, isn't it? Um, agree. And she goes back to Valinor because she goes like straight back to Valinor uh, in in the published Silmarillion. That. For whom she had chosen never to fare back to Valinor in the beauty of the God. Never. So we have this idea or possibility, probability, that Gwendolyn has forsaken Valinor, that, that her trip from Valinor to the Outer Lands was a one way ticket. And now she's lost Tinwellant, for which she, forsa she forsook Valinor. And now. Did there seem to her neither beauty nor joy, be it in Valinor or in the lands without? And now all beauty and joy has been stripped from her everywhere. I mean, this is, this, that's really sad. In fact, when you think about it, doesn't the description of Arwen's grief after Aragorn's death sound like kind of a memory of this? Um, the wandering alone in the woods and everything. Anyhow, um, the pity of the scattered... She meets scattered elves and they have pity on her and she heeds them not. Um, it's, uh, it's remarkable. She's so much more frail. She's so much smaller. Um, less the goddess and more mortal. Um, in fact, it's... She hasn't chosen mortality in her ultimate fate, but she seems to really have descended much further. Um, but that's pretty typical from what we've seen in the Book of Lost Tales compared to the later works, um, that uh, everybody, um, almost everybody in the Silmarillion is bigger than they were in the Book of Lost Tales. And we've talked, we talked about that a great deal in the last class. Um, then... We get that really awkward mother-in-law visit when she comes and <laughs> visits Baron and Tenuhio. Uh And here Baron has defeated Nauglador and taken the Nauglafring and the Silmaril and put it on Luthien. And he's like, it's awesome, right? It's the most beautiful elf maiden ever. And uh, she's got the most gorgeous piece of bling that anyone's ever made, right? And the Silmaril. This was, this was totally meant to be, right? Um, doesn't go over so well with the mother-in-law, 
right? Then wrathfully she asked of Baron what it might portend, and wherefore he suffered the accursed thing to touch Tenuvio, and told Baron all that tale such as Huan had told him, in deed or guess, and of the pursuit and fighting at the ford he told also, saying at the end, Nor indeed do I see who, now that Lord Tinwellant is fair to Valinor, should so fittingly wear that jewel of the gods as Tenuvio. Baron, totally not getting it. Right. It's like, you know, she's like, the accursed thing! Like, why have you put this, like, radioactive thing on my daughter? And Baron's like, who would most, who would more fittingly have it, right? I mean, okay, yeah, so Tin Wellen, it's Tin Wellens, but he's dead? Um, clearly, right? What's the, what's the, what's the problem? Um, you know, th- there's almost like, a faint subtext of, like, did you want it for yourself, right? Like, who else is supposed to, why are you objecting? to Tenuvio having it. Like, unless you want it. Like, seriously, what else is there, right? Um, he's not getting the business about the curse. He doesn't know about the curse. But Gwendolyn told of the dragon's ban upon the gold and the staining, possibly, of blood in the king's halls, and yet another and more potent curse, whose arising I know not, is woven therewith. So, the dragon's ban is upon the gold. The dragon has laid his curse upon the gold. And then there's some other even more potent curse. This is Meme's curse, of course, but Gwendolyn doesn't know about Meme. Um, but she just knows there's this some hideously potent curse whose arising I know not is woven therewith. Nor, methinks, was the labor of the dwarves free from spells of the most enduring malice. So, the very necklace of the Naglafring itself, it's not only cursed, but it's evil. Right? It is full of the malicious thoughts of its craftsmen. Well, that's kind of creepy. Baron still is Mr. Sunshine, right? But Baron laughed, saying that the glory of the Silmaril and its holiness might overcome all such evils, even as it burnt the foul flesh of, of, of Carcaras. Nor, said he, have I ever seen my, have I seen ever my Tenuvial so fair as she now is, clasped in the loveliness of this thing of gold. But Gwendolyn said, Yet the Silmaril abode in the crown of Melko. And that is the work of Baleful Smiths indeed. Right. It's just possible that the Silmarils might also be tainted by similar uh, cursings. Um, uh, this is uh, a remarkable moment. Um, the suggestion here uh, that the Silmaril has been itself corrupted by its possession with Morgoth, by its possession by Morgoth, um, is a pretty remarkable one. We don't get anything like that in the published Silmarillion. Um, and the parallel that that Gwendolyn establishes between the Nauglifring and the Curse of Meme and the possession, you know, so the, the possession of the gold by the dragon and the possession of the Silmaril by Morgoth, Melko, excuse me. Um, you know, she's, she's establishing that parallel to, to suggest, again, that same kind of cursing, that, um, that, that insatiable desire, that greed, that lust for treasure is a consequence of this kind of malicious, corruptive influence. Um, well, that's kind of a... kind of a bummer at the end of the story of Baron and Tenuvio. I mean, like, their whole... And you got to think that Baron would feel a little bit deflated by this, right? It's like, so... So you're telling me that actually our whole get the Silmaril thing, which was kind of, you know pretty heroic and stuff actually just was we were just getting this cursed thing and bringing a dangerous evil thing back and now it's like multiplicative evil um, that you know is now hanging around Tenuvio's neck Um, that's kind of a downer (laughs) at the end of the Baron and Tenuvio story right um, well, and look what he goes on to say about it. Thereafter did Gwendolyn abide a while in the woods among them, and was healed. Well, that's nice, though she doesn't really sound like a very cheerful mother-in-law to have living with you. 
And in the end she fared wistfully back to the land of Lorien, and came never again into the tales of the dwellers of Earth. So apparently it wasn't permanent that she had to leave. But upon Baron and Tenuvial fell swiftly that doom of mortality that Mandos had spoken when he sped them from his halls, and in this perhaps did the curse of Meme have potency in that it came more soon upon them, nor this time did those twain fare the road nor this time did those twain fare the road together. But when yet was the child of those twain, Dior the Fair, a little one, did Tenuvial slowly fade, even as the elves of later days have done throughout the world. And she vanished in the woods, and none have seen her dancing ever there again. But Baron searched all the lands of Hithlam and of Artenor ranging after her, and never has any of the elves had more loneliness than his, or ever he too fared from life, and Dior his son was left ruler of the brown elves and the green, and the lord and lord of the Nauglifring. Mayhap what all elves say is true, that those twain hunt now in the forest of Orame and Valinor, and Tenuviel dances on the green swords of Nessa and of Vanna, daughters of the gods for evermore, yet great was the grief of the elves when the, when, when the Gwilwarthan went from among them, and being leaderless and lessened of magic, their numbers minished, and many fared away to Gondolin, the rumor of whose growing power and glory ran in secret whispers among all the elves. Yeah, Brianna, isn't that a terrible, sad ending of Baron's story there? I mean, talk about superlatives you don't want attached to you, right? We get all these cool superlatives, like tallest of all of the children of Iluvatar. That's the thing going the published Silmarillion. Uh, most beautiful of all of the children of Iluvatar. That's Luthien, of course. Um, but, uh, uh, but, man... Um, Never has any of the elves had more loneliness than his. Most lonely? Ouch. Um, ouch. Um, yeah, Yana and James are both suggesting, isn't there a problem with the chronology here? Yeah, there kind of is. Uh, Christopher Tolkien t alluded to it in his commentary there, um, that there seems to be some kind of a slip, or maybe, you know, he suggests there's a way you can interpret it where it kind of all makes sense. But... Uh, but yeah, the chronology there isn't isn't all very isn't isn't all that clear. But anyway, um, the end of Baron and Tenuvial's story, as we get it in the story of the Nauglifring, ultimately is one of tragedy. Okay, so wait, actually, the curse of Meme doesn't end with the treasure in the river, right? Because there's still the one piece of treasure, and remember, explicitly, Meme said this treasure or any portion of it, right? Uh, and a portion of the treasure was wrought into the Nauglifring, so it counts, um, that in the end we see Baron and Tenuvio overcome by the curse of Meme, and their mortality is hastened, not by the splendor and glory of the divine beauty of Luthien bearing the Silmaril, but of the curse of Meme. Um, and... Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty sad, but again, pretty striking that this story about the curse on the dragon treasure ends up, tr in a sense, I want to say, trumping the story of the tale of Tenuvio that we looked at first. Um, remember when we were looking at the end of that story, the, like, sad ending, happy ending, right? Different possibilities that we were getting there of that story. Well, where we've actually come to is really sort of depressing and calls into question, in a sense, the whole issue of their fate and of Mandos's doom upon them, right? Um, the doom of mortality that Mandos had spoken. Is that a... Like, why are they made mortal? Is it a punishment? Is he just kind of anticipating the their destruction by the uh, curse of meme? You know, I mean... Uh, I, I think it kind of makes... I find this a relatively unsatisfying end of the story of Baron and Tenuviel. The fact that um, even... 
in Baron's words, hearing what seems to be sort of an echo of that dissatisfaction, right? You know, of like Baron himself sort of saying to Gwendolyn, you know, dude, are you implying that the curse of this random dwarf like ultimately makes our whole story pointless? Mm, yeah, kind of. Yeah, actually. Um, and that's that's awful sad. Um, uh, yeah, and I mean, it's, and you know, Tom is right. I, I don't want to die. I don't want to shortchange this. I keep talking about the sad ending as if that's a bad thing, right? Um, I mean, I made a joke earlier on about, you know, it's a, it's a Norse story, and so they all lived sadly ever after. Or, so, you know, nobody lived happily ever after. Um, uh, but Tom, of course, is, is, is calling me to task on that, you know, that it's, that it is, you know, the endless woes, uh, you know, of a particular house, or, you know, a story ending in destruction like this, um, is, is, is very mythic. Tom is pointing, as Tom is so wont to do, uh, pointing to classical, uh, versions, like the story of the House of Tantalus, or the House of Atreus, um, or the House of Laius, yeah, yeah, and also the Norse sagas as well. We certainly do get these mythic ideas of these weighty curses that bring everyone in that line to destruction. Um, you know, of course, Turin, Turin Turinbar is made out of that, it's cut from that same cloth. Um, f- again, from a northern thing, not Old Norse stories there, but Finnish stories in the Kalevala. Um, uh, but... Um, b- but again, still, you know, that, that idea of the curse bringing doom and destruction and everybody dies and is unhappy. The end, you know, I might not like that kind of story very much, but of course I can't exactly throw stones and say, oh, therefore it's not very good, right? Um, Yes, Arthur, the Atreides, the sad story of the Atreides. That's exactly exactly what I'm talking about there. Um, Just in case, you know, it's like relevant to uh, any other books we've read recently. Um, Anyway, okay, I will let you guys go. The two chapters we have left, we have three classes and two chapters left. Um, We are now, and as Christopher said in his little introduction to the story of the Nauglifring, this story of the Nauglifring is the final story written for the Lost Tales. That doesn't mean it's the end of the story, it just means the last one that he actually gave a narrative form to. Um, the final two chapters are we, are, we are entering into the world of sort of speculation, um, which means it's even more fun to talk about, because now we move away from the lost tales that Tolkien actually wrote and begin to talk about the lost tales that Tolkien didn't write, but, but almost wrote or might have written. And that's even more fun to talk about. Um, but seriously, one of the things we'll be doing as we look at the story of Eärendil, and then the direction in which the directions in which Tolkien was thinking of taking the frame narrative of Ariel and the Cottage of Lost Play, um, we um, uh, uh, we are going to. It's going to bring us to talk more about the overall direction of the story, the overall direction of where kind of Tolkien was heading and how his overall thinking is starting to change, especially in the, um, in the final chapter, the, uh, the Ariel or Alfwina of England, um, story. So, um, uh, so that's where we're going next. Um, it means in some ways that these next two chapters are a bit of a slog because it's mostly Christopher trying to piece fragments together and telling us how he thinks things might fit. We're not going to get any kind of narratives in which to immerse ourselves in the same way you know that we do in these other uh, in these other stories. So, um, uh, so be prepared for that. Um, but they're they're really fascinating to talk about, and I'm really looking forward to that. So. I will see you next week when we finally get to the story of the messianic Ariandel. Ariandel. Ariandel? What the heck was that? I was talking about Ariel, too. Ariandel. Uh, you know, the sort of the culmination of all the stories that it's been awesome, and we can't wait to meet Ariandel, so we'll talk about that next time. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. I'll see you next week. Bye.